today we're going to be looking at the launching of the actual United States of America. We have the Constitution um, that has now been ratified. Um, we will now have an election for president, uh, an election for both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And so now this government that was put together um, by those delegates at the Constitutional Convention will actually come into place. So if you have American pageant, this will this will be chapter 10's uh, material, um, but in some other textbooks um, that might differ on what chapter that is, but this will be after the Constitution has been set in place, what will the initial government look like and how will it function will be what we'll cover today. So the first overarching discussion question that we have over chapter 10 is, what were the most important steps that Washington took to establish the authority and prestige of the new federal government under the Constitution? Now, um, in 1789, it was clear that Washington would be the president. As a matter of fact, during the Constitutional Convention, many of the delegates were arguing that the the office of the president should be designed with Washington in mind. Washington will be unanimously elected by the Electoral College in 1789, and he took the oath of office then in April, uh, April 30th of 1789. Um, he then decides to establish a cabinet. Now that's a decision he makes. He decides that he needs multiple people to help him carry out the functions of the office of the presidency. So some of the key figures that you need to know there is the Secretary of State will be Thomas Jefferson. The Secretary of State is really going to function as um, the top position. The Secretary of State will cover the functions of the office of the presidency when the president is absent. Um, Secretary of State will represent the president overseas and will have the power to oversee the functions of the executive branch of office. Um, most likely, what we would consider the next important position would be the Secretary of Treasury. And that would be Alexander Hamilton. He, while unpopular um, to many political figures, Washington always trusted him, and there was no doubt about his intellect when it came especially to economic matters. So he is the Secretary of Treasury. If you remember early on, um, when the Constitution is being discussed, when they're talking about reforming the Articles of Confederation, Hamilton is one of the key figures who brings up um, the inability to trade between states. So he is a natural selection there for Secretary of Treasury. And, and the, the other major position will be Secretary of War, Henry Knox. Notice I didn't say Vice Presidency, and we're gonna deal with this more as, as the year progresses. Um, but John Adams will be the first vice president, but the vice president's roles and duties are really, really lacking. Um, it's not something that you really see um, the, the president uh, place a lot of focus on. As a matter of fact, he's not even allowed in a lot of the cabinet meetings. Um, so I kind of went backwards there, but that was the establishment of the cabinet that Washington does very quickly. Some of the challenges that are going on there as Washington becomes president is the population growth. Um, the American population was doubling every, about every 25 years during the 1700s, so it was growing rather quickly. So quickly you need to put in place a functional government and a representative government even while the population there is moving on you rather quickly. Um, the other thing is demographics are changing. Uh, demographics are changing. You have immigrant populations moving in. You also have many that are beginning to move to these larger cities um, to try to accumulate more of a power in this new economic world that's coming into play. Um, one of the very important things that Washington discusses early on and describes is the, his belief that his serving the office was out of a duty. That he felt a duty to the country to serve in this particular office. Um, that, that it wasn't to further his you know, political career, to, to gain more power, that it was simply because he felt like he had a responsibility to the country. He felt he had a responsibility to lead um, the, the military in the American Revolution. He felt he had a duty to become president as well. And that's why it's really you know, very easy for him um, to, after two terms, make the announcement that I'm done, that I'm not gonna serve any more in office. Um, uh, that does come as a big surprise to Adams and 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 Hamilton. Uh, but you know, looking back on Washington and, and kind of reading his letters and, and listening to the way he described the office itself, 
he always made it very clear that this was a duty to him, that this wasn't something he was wanting to do for a long period of time. He really wanted to get back home as soon as possible. So Washington will set in place a precedent that a president should only serve two terms, because from this point on, if you decide to serve more than two terms in office or even contemplate that, a lot of people remind um, those individuals that, well, Washington thought he shouldn't. So do you really think that you're better than George Washington? The next discussion question is explain the purpose and significance of the Bill of Rights. Did these 10 amendments weaken or strengthen the federal government? Now, remember that the Constitution is ratified, but with the understanding, with the promise that the first one of the first votes Congress will take will be on a Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights that will ensure certain rights to the citizens that the government um, cannot take away from them. Now, there is, so in several states, without this Bill of Rights, um, it's likely that the Constitution would not have passed. So, um, the Bill of Rights, most of the amendments you will be very aware of. I do want to point out that there's two ways to amend the Constitution of the United States, as laid out in Article 5 of the Constitution. You can either go through Congress um, to get those amendments passed, or you can go directly to the states and have the states actually amend the Constitution around Congress. That was put in there by George Mason in the Constitutional Convention. Um, Amendment 9 and Amendment 10 are two that I particularly want to focus in on at this point. You've already gone through the other amendments when you looked at the Constitution there in your constitutional seminar. Amendment 9 says um, that there are certain rights that are enumerated that are listed in the Constitution, but that should not be used to say because we didn't list something it means you don't have it there were many that were actually against the bill of rights because they thought that's precisely what might happen is if they say oh you have the freedom of speech um that then they might come along and say later well we didn't say you have the right to keep and bear arms so i guess you don't have that right so article 9 was said look just because we don't list all of them doesn't mean there aren't other rights that are out there um, because, of course, the Constitution only gives the government certain powers, right? So only the powers laid out in, in Article 1, Article 2, Article 3 are the powers that the government has. So Article 9 says, listen, if we don't list a right, that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. So we're going to see when later on in American history we give women the right to vote, um, we give African Americans the right to vote. I mean, again, you cannot say, well, that right doesn't exist because it wasn't listed. Because Article no uh, Amendment 9 says, just because we don't list it doesn't mean there aren't other rights out there. And Article 10 caps off the Bill of Rights. And what it says is, the, the powers not given to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people respectfully. So... If they didn't list a power given under the federal government, that power is reserved to the states um, and the people in those states. So it is a meant to clarify that on, the federal government can only do what powers are stated that it can, that it has. The federal government only has the power that was given to it in the Constitution, that there is no other power that it has that is restricted by what was listed to it. Also, when you were going over the Constitution, you also noticed that Article 3 had very little to say about the courts, about the about the judiciary. It, it did lay out a Supreme Court, it, um, but it didn't talk about what the other federal courts would look like. So in 1789, Congress passes the Judiciary Act, which sets up the federal court system. Um, so that is significant in the way the courts look. Um, it, it actually creates how many will sit on the Supreme Court, how many individuals are on the Supreme Court, also the Office of the Attorney General, and our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will be a man named John Jay. He will be the first Chief Justice. So this is where you really begin to see what the judiciary system is gonna look like in the United States. So I hope with all of that being said, you see that 
the Bill of Rights was meant to weaken the power of the federal government to ensure that the citizens would retain certain rights. Okay, well now things are about to get fun because um, while you had this set up that I went over in those uh, with those first two discussion questions on what the government's going to look like and Washington coming to power, one of the things that Washington has done is Washington has put two individuals that disagree on a lot of things, but they have a philosophical disagreement. That's going to be Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. So the next discussion question is, what were Hamilton's basic economic and political goals? How did he achieve them? Compare and contrast the philosophical and political disagreements between Hamilton and Jefferson. What are the consequences of this disagreement? And I can't place a big enough emphasis on this political debate that's about to happen. Um, there are some political scientists that argue that this is you know, your impetus of what we see today between what we call the left and the right on how far should the government go, um, how much should be retained to the people in the state. So you're going to see that play out here at this moment. So Alexander Hamilton is the Secretary of Treasury. He wants a revival of the public credit. What he would like to see is there to be a system in place at which he strengthens national credit by allowing the government to pay off its debts plus interest. Um, he also pushed for assumption, which would mean that the federal government would actually pay off the debt of the states. So they would assume the debt the states have and, and, and give them the money. Now, now, why did he do that? Why did he believe in that? Well, he thought that running a debt would actually be a benefit for the country in the long run because he thought he did the logic goes something like this so if any of you have ever had you know credit card or whatever else um there is a benefit now of course that's very dangerous to do right because you could fall into debt and not be able to pay your way out but the benefit of having credit is if you pay it off you build up a credit score which then reflects that you are responsible and pay off your debts. This is this is Hamilton's logic, is that if we take on a debt, but we pay off that debt, we are then showing other countries around the world that we are responsible. We have the fiscal discipline to pay off debts. So in essence, giving us a, a high credit score. So this is what he really felt would be a benefit. And he also saw that it's important that the government find ways to raise money to have revenue. That was one of the problems with the Articles of Confederation. So he quickly moves into um, imposing taxes on certain imports. So this is going to be um, his, the first tariff law, which is going to bring in quite a bit of revenue to the federal government. He's also going to pass an excise task, uh, tax on a few items, including whiskey. So that's um, going to help bring in quite a bit of money as well. So he's actually implementing some taxing um, policies here. He's He is supporting them. Well, I say he, so he does pass through Congress, but it is his recommendation that these things are done. Um, so as we begin to see these things occur, Hamilton makes an argument that there needs to be a bank of the United States, that this bank would print paper money and that way provide a, a stability for how much paper money is going to be worth in America and how much of it would actually be put in circulation. One of the major problems with this is it doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution anything about a national bank. So, so Thomas Jefferson quickly points that out and says, so you think that the federal government should be the body that determines or that holds money that's the only responsible party that the states couldn't do that themselves and he felt like it was unconstitutional that it wasn't in the constitution itself so thomas jefferson's going to quickly oppose there being a bank of the united states but um again uh, hamilton's going to in essence get his way here and there will be a national bank established um in philadelphia in, in 1791 that'll last for about 20 years so now we're going to dig deeper into the issue of the National Bank. Um, obviously, the benefits are um, setting a currency that's stable, 
uh, giving more power and responsibility over the federal government shows that this government's here to last. One of the important things that we need to keep in mind is it's easy for us to look back today and say, you know, um, the con you know, the government was going to be around for a long time. Like this was just the beginning of America. One thing to remember is these these people, Washington, Adams, you know, Franklin, Jefferson, they don't necessarily believe that. They think that it's that the country is just getting started. The government's just getting started. If if something goes wrong, this could all be over. I mean, this new government could be over in two years. So they think all of their decisions here are critical, that they're very important, that other countries believe that this government is here to stay. So this argument becomes very volatile very quick. Jefferson saying, you're already going way beyond the powers that were, giving over, that were given over to the federal government. It doesn't say that you can have a national bank in the Constitution, and we should read the Constitution in that way. If it doesn't say it, you shouldn't do it. This is what we call strict uh, con strict interpretation. Okay, so this, this strict interpretation of the Constitution. If it doesn't say it, you can't do it. And Hamilton says, I found in the Constitution where it says I can have a national bank, and he points to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is known as the Necessary and Proper Clause. It's also known as the Elastic Clause, because it can be stretched out to say a lot of things. So I'm just going to read you that uh, particular clause now. Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all the other powers vested in this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. So Hamilton says, look, we have the we have the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the ability to pass laws pertaining to Congress, uh, pertaining to commerce, and this deals with commerce. So it's necessary and proper that we have a national bank to deal with the um, commerce between states. So that's his argument. Um, Hamilton will win out. Uh, there will be a national bank created. Next, remember that Hamilton has taxed something that the colonists particularly hold tight to, and that is whiskey. So you have a lot of people very frustrated that the cost of their whiskey went up dramatically. And so this is going to put in place, the, well, this is going to push a whiskey rebellion in 1794 um, by those who oppose this tax. Um, the, uh, the rebellion was ended by Washington sending in federal troops, actually, to put down this rebellion. So it took quite a drastic measure. Um, but this is also an important moment that Washington shows that these laws that are passed will be enforced. So you have, at the end of this, really two political parties that emerge. Um, you have the Federalists, which are defending the strength of the federal government. Um, the federal government should be taking on these responsibilities. So this is this is you know Hamilton, this is Adams, this is Washington, um, and you have an opposition party. You have Thomas Jefferson, um, you have James Madison, um, that are questioning whether the federal government should be doing all of these things. So this is um, not stated yet, but you're starting to see this begin to differentiate itself into two different groups. So now let's take a look at the Washington administration and also the Adams after Washington and what their foreign policy is going to look like and how successful they were in achieving their foreign policy goals. Now, first of all, we have to remember that during this time period, the 1790s, the French Revolution is going on. So if you don't know about the French Revolution, it is a fascinating time in French history. I would suggest you pause this lecture right now and go find a video, find a book, and definitely read up on what's going on over there. But they use a lot of the language that the Americans use in the American Revolution. Thomas Paine actually goes over there to help them with some of the literature. Thomas Jefferson lends his talents to this. And so very quickly, we see two groups in America. One, Jefferson's faction of what we're going to be called the Jeffersonian Republicans that are saying, we have to go help the French. We've got to help them overturn the monarchy because they're trying to do what we did here. And then another group, which is the Federalists, which is Adams, which is Washington, which is Hamilton, that say, we don't need to get involved. We're a brand new country. We just got out of a war. We really don't want to go get involved in what's going on over there. And by the way, we're hearing stories that it's really turning nasty. That's very, very violent. 
So the Washington administration, again, you're going to see Washington siding with Hamilton, um, is going to draft a neutrality statement, which says we're not taking either side. Uh, we're not taking the side of, of the monarchy, and we're not taking the side of of the French, you know, people, but we're also not going to get involved in the French Britain back and forth that's going on. Now this really frustrates Jefferson uh, because Jefferson notes that if it wasn't for the French, the Americans um, probably wouldn't have won the American Revolution, that it was crucial they had the help of the French, especially the Marquis de Lafayette and um, his talents that he brought to the effort on the uh, Patriot side of things. So Jefferson is particularly frustrated that we are not there to help the French people during during their time of revolution. So what's going to happen next is a series of editorials that will be in many papers in the D.C. area and in the Northeast. And this is what's going to be known as the Pacificus Helvidius Debates. So Pacificus is, is actually Hamilton writing under pseudonym, um, describing why it's so important the United States remains neutral during this, uh, during this French versus British struggle that's been going on. Um, Helvidius is actually going to be James Madison. Jefferson goes to Madison and says, hey, we really need a response to this. And so he decides to write under the pseudonym Helvidius um, and respond as to why it's why he felt it was very important to support the French while they were fighting for their freedoms. Then you're going to have uh, two treaties that come up as as you have the British becoming more involved in the frontier po posts. Um, the British are looking to continue the fur trade. They, they were concerned that if they could, did not continue um, trading furs in the North American continent, that they would fall well behind the French in this uh, economic uh, resource. So they continue to um, get involved along, especially with some of the Native American tribes. And so this is going to be part of what pushes John Jay's treaty with the British government um, to keep relations normalized between the two countries, Great Britain and America. And then you're also going to see Pinckney's treaty, which pops up in 1795, and that's with Spain. So you have two treaties that form. These are, you know, uh, important because it's really the first time that the United States is going to form uh, these type of treaties. And then in 1797, you're going to have George Washington's farewell which, you know, a lot of times presidential farewell addresses are not particularly important because it's just a president trying to convince you that he did a really good job. But Washington's is one that's important. And one of the things that Washington does is he makes two warnings. First of all, he warns against political parties. He believes that if you, if Americans join political parties, if two political parties occur, they're just the opposite of each other. You know, if one says we need to raise taxes, the other one says we don't. If one says we need to go to war, the other one says we don't. And he found that to be very problematic for politics. He would rather there not be two sides, that there might be multiple points of view, and that, you know, you might have different coalitions that form depending on the topic. But he believed that political parties usually put people in two camps, and one is always against the other. So uh, that you're going to see is going to, like, take place immediately after he leaves office. You're going to have two political parties form. And the other thing he warned about was foreign entanglements. Washington was very concerned that if you begin to get involved in foreign affairs, you're going to get drug into it, that there might not be a way out of, the, out of that, those particular battles and wars. So one of the things that he thought was very important about America was that we had a, an ocean between us and the, the British, the French, the Spanish, that we could stay neutral. We don't have to get involved in all their wars. And so he felt like we should use that to our advantage and keep away from picking a side in their disputes. Now, I'm going to not say a lot on this, this discussion question. I'm really going to leave this up to you.
there's a lot of different ways you can go with this, but the discussion question is how did divisions over foreign policy, especially the French Revolution, poison American politics, and did this threaten the fledgling nation's unity in the 1790s? Which side was right? You know, again, that this is something that uh, I, I like this question for a lot of reasons, but I think that your current political point of view might might really reflect here in the way you answer this question. Now, if you feel like America has been too involved in, in foreign policy, um, you would probably take Hamilton and Washington's point of view that shouldn't have been involved. Um, if, if you think that America is much better off getting involved um, when you feel like one side is right on in someone else's war, then you would you would probably side with Jefferson and Madison and say, look, America should have stood up for um, the side that they viewed was correct here. Um, regardless, it is very fascinating to view this as really our first foreign policy that we put together as a country. And during this critical early time, how close Americans were um, to really being divided, that, that it was essential that we had this unity. And luckily, Washington's president and both sides generally respected him. But by the end of his presidency, there's a lot of frustration by Jefferson and Madison and their faction that believed he wasn't doing enough to help out overseas. And also he was gaining too much power by creating a national bank, by raising taxes in the manner in which he did. So there is this moment here of who's next, of who's going to be the next president because of this disruption, because of this political division going on in the country. The second president of the United States will be John Adams. The vice president will win that election and become the new president of the United States. And very quickly, um, we see him having to deal with these issues that were carryovers from the Washington presidency. So the last discussion question we're going to cover today. What were the main domestic issues facing the Adams administration? How did he handle these? And what were the short term and long term consequences? Well, there's an interesting situation that occurs right after Adams becomes president, and it is what's known as the XYZ affair. And it's one of those things um, that blows up in America, but when you read the European sources on this topic, they don't understand why the Americans are so upset. So um, it goes something like this. Jefferson tries to get a meeting with some French ambassadors. So we send over three ambassadors over to um, France to try to talk to um, Napoleon's government that's coming into power. And their three diplomats demand us pay a ransom. Oh, well, I should say a ransom. Uh, they demand us pay a, a bribe, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, uh, give them money in order for them to talk to us. Well, this infuriates our diplomats who come home and tell Adams about this and the word begins to spread and the Americans are just really, really livid that the French would do that, that you wouldn't just talk to us directly. Now, again, the European sources on this, some of them say that this was pretty a regular deal. It wasn't like they were picking on the Americans, but the Americans felt like this was a slap in the face. So um, uh, the Americans, uh, particularly in the press and the po politicians of the day, really believed that uh, there's going to be a war between America and France. That, that really looks to be um, what a lot of people think is going to happen. And particularly, Adams was always more of an Anglophile. He really liked the British culture. Um, he did not like the French culture. He visits France um, just before Washington becomes president. Does not like it. Does not like it at all. So, I mean, he's one that a lot of people believe genuinely liked the British more than they liked the French, and so that caused many to think that he would go to war with, with the French. Then he passes two very controversial laws. Um, gets them through Congress, the A Alien Acts, and then the, uh, the Alien Laws, and then the Sedition Act. The Alien Laws um, had resident requirements for aliens that wanted to be citizens. And it said that the president could deport or jail foreigners um, in times of peace or at times of war. The Sedition Act stated 
um, that anyone who defamed officials would be liable to a heavy fine and imprisonment. Now, this really sends Jefferson through the roof. Um, Thomas Jefferson believes that both of these are violations of the Constitution, in particular the Sedition Acts, that criticizing a foreign official uh, or a, a political official was in essence what what was so much of what they did during the American Revolution. I mean, that's what Jefferson was doing. That's what Adams was doing, that they were criticizing the government. Sometimes they were doing it in a deflammatory way. So he felt like they are in great violation of the Constitution and these laws that were passed. So what can Jefferson do about it? So the first thing he does was very controversial. And his in, in the state of Kentucky, um, Jefferson supports and helps push through um, a resolution, and also in Virginia, and that was really Madison in Virginia and Jefferson in, in Kentucky, pushed through these re resolutions that say that a state does not have to obey the federal government, even if they pass, even if the federal government passes a law and it's signed by the president, uh, it passes a bill and it's signed under president, so it's the law. They do not have to obey that law if it violates the Constitution. So if a state deems a law violates the Constitution, they are not going to listen to it. That's what they pass in Kentucky and Virginia. Again, incredibly controversial political theory there that, that, that during the time that the states could refuse to do that. Now, this opens up a whole debate on do the states have that power. The Jeffersonians say, well, of course we do, because if the federal government does something that's not one of their powers, then they can't do it, so why would we follow that law? Now, Adams thinks this is undermining the entire government itself, that if you have states that don't listen to what the federal government says, that you could have anarchy. So, because of this split, the two that used to be friends, former friends, Adams and Jefferson were close, are going to go against each other in the eight in the eight in the presidential election of 1800 Adams is going to be the president running against Thomas Jefferson the challenger and what's going to go down as one of the nastiest um, presidential elections in history and now you have the really sharp division between a government that is give that more power resides in the states or the a government where more power resides in the federal government so we will deal with that in the next lecture